I'm analyzing the book The Beginning of Infinity by David Deutsch. This is part 10. This time we're only going to talk about a single sentence. On page 22, David wrote, As the physicist Richard Feynman said, science is what we have learned about how to keep from fooling ourselves. This is a misquote. Feynman did not say that. So how do I know it's a misquote? I searched for it. First, I figured it was probably from the essay Cargo Cult Science, not essay, um, is a speech he gave, which has been transcribed and put online. So I searched in Cargo Cult Science, and it was not there. He does say similar things there. It's not like the opposite of what Feynman believes or something. Um, it's the kind of thing he might have agreed with or might have even said, but he didn't say it, as far as anyone knows. So it was not in the source that I first thought of. So I searched the internet, um, multiple search engines, which is helpful when you're trying to find something that's hard to find. Like if you only search one search engine, you might miss something that you could have found if you'd used more search engines. So the quote appears online a lot. You've got many results. And the results on different search engines are noticeably different. Like Google has more spammy quote page things than Bing. Anyway, it's online many times, but each time there's no source. So there, it's not like a, you know, you're finding someone saying Feynman said it with no evidence. So it doesn't help. So I searched three Feynman books, including the two in the bibliography of BOI, which are The Meaning of It All and The Character of Physical Law. And it's not in those books. And I searched for the word fool, which will find fooling, but will also find other things. And so I read everything that's similar, and it's just not there. Um, it's important to do that in case there's a typo in your book. Um, it could be like an OCR error or something. So you want to search something shorter and similar and look through things by hand just to make sure that there isn't a problem with your computer text search. All right, so on top of that, I asked three other people to look into it. So Alan searched five Feynman books and couldn't find the quote. Justin couldn't find the quote, but he found an article called Magical Thinking from the year 2000, and he said it was the earliest use of that text that he could find. And in that article, it attributes the text to Feynman, but it doesn't put quote marks around it, and there's no source. And so I think it might not have been intended to be a quote, but it makes it sound like it's a quote. I can understand why people would read it as a quote. It says something like Feynman put it like this, and then it gives the text, but there's no quotes around it. And if you look at other things, the article does use quote marks. You know, it says someone else said something and it puts it in quotes, but with Feynman, it didn't put quotes. So I don't think it was intended as a quote. I think it was kind of a, a snafu, a mishap. Like, I don't think it was malice. I don't think someone was like trying to lie on purpose. I think someone was just really sloppy and then other people read it and assumed it was a quote and they were really sloppy too and then they spread it. And the author of that article died, so we can't ask him what happened and if he actually had a source or if he just thought it wasn't a quote and didn't realize he would trick people or what. So I think it probably spread from that article because the, the words are exactly the same. That's how you can usually tell when something comes from a particular source is if it's the exact same wording. Uh, the quote is also in the book Here Be Dragons from 2016. However, there's a footnote on that quote, and it says that the author was unable to find a source for Feynman actually saying it. In which case, why did he put it in his book? If he knows that there's no source for it, he should not quote it in his book. That's really unreasonable. Um, it shows how bad of an attitude people have about quotes. Even when he couldn't find the quote, a source for the quote, he still used it anyways. He still spread it. What the heck is he doing? That's awful. So what counts as a source? Not everyone seems to know this, but a source would be when and where Feynman originally said it. Like what year? Was it in a book? Was it in a speech? Was it at a particular event? Was there a location? You know, info like that is a source. So if you find a web page and it says Feynman said it, that's not a source because it's not saying when or where. It doesn't give you the details. It's just this web page claims with no evidence that Feynman said it. So it's not okay to quote things because some web page that has no source quoted it. Similarly, if you find it in a book, but the book doesn't have a source, that's not good enough. You need to be able to track down the original source or the primary source. 
And if you can't do that, do not use the quote. You should not give people the benefit of the doubt and then use the quote. Like, you might give them the benefit of the doubt in some way, like, but you should not be using the quote based on giving someone else the benefit of the doubt. That's not nearly good enough for you to use the quote yourself. You should be skeptical of it. Um, David's misquote is spreading. So it's in books. Um, there's some book called Darwin's Racism from 2016, and it has the Feynman misquote, and it cites BOI as the source. It says something like, as quoted in BOI. And then there's this online book called Capitalism, the Liberal Revolution, and it has, again, the same quote, and it says it's cited from BOI. So people are like, well, David quoted it, therefore I can quote it, and they use that. And I think some of them actually look for a primary source, don't find it, and then quote it from BOI because they couldn't find a better source, so they use BOI. But if you can't find a better source and BOI doesn't tell you where the better source is, then you shouldn't be using the quote. So I think there's something really broken there. If someone wondered what the source was, looked for it, couldn't find a real source, and then used BOI to blame David, um, they shouldn't be doing that. That's really irresponsible. But it's more David's fault. Like, he's the one who spread it in the first place. So he's more to the blame than the people quoting him and trusting his scholarship. So on Wikiquote, a website, there is there are a bunch of unsourced Feynman quotes that people spread around. They're likely all misquotes, and there's discussion of them and attempts to find sources for things and so on. One of the misquotes is, science is a way of trying not to fool yourself. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. And actually, the second sentence of that is a real quote. Wikiquote gives two separate sources. Feynman said it at two different times, like around a decade apart. It's in cargo cult science, but he actually said some of the same things in a speech earlier, which was published in The Pleasure of Finding Things Out which I checked that book. That was the third book I checked besides the two in BOI's bibliography. Anyways, but so the, the second sentence here is a real Feynman quote, and the first one is not, and so this has been spread around. So spreading myth quotes around is a pretty common problem, especially with popular people like Feynman. It, it happens more with older historical figures like uh, Lincoln or Washington or someone would be the kind of people that people make up fake quotes about, or Edmund Burke is one that I've seen fake quotes of and researched before. Feynman is overly recent to have fake quotes uh, to the same degree, yet apparently it still happens a lot. So in general, text inside quote marks should be exact. Not close, not a paraphrase, but exact. If you don't want to make it exact, don't use quotes. Um, this is an important tradition of scholarship and being an intellectual and writing books and stuff, is to actually get quotes right. The tradition is not as uh, as thorough as you might imagine. Um, a lot of people are pretty careless with it, but there's a tradition where people know that it matters and that quotes are supposed to be exact, um, even if they don't actually do it all the time. It comes up with uh, newspapers and stuff as well. They often misquote people. It's an ongoing problem, but their readers know that quotes are supposed to be exact, so they actually trust it when they see quote marks. They figure it's real. And, I mean, the majority of the time it's real, but it's not always. So scholars, intellectuals, journalists are the type who especially care about accurate quotes, or at least claim to. Um, a misquote is not comparable to a typo. It's much worse. It's not just, oh, he made a mistake. Mistakes happen. Every book has a few mistakes in it. Um, misquotes are avoidable and much more serious than um, just a regular mistake. Every single time an author puts quotes in their book and says, you know, so-and-so said X, quote this in these exact words, um, the author, it's his job, it's his duty to verify that it's actually a real quote and then he knows what he's talking about, so he's not just spreading a lie around the world. So I predict, I suspect, that if Dee Dee was aware of this error, he would be mortified and apologetic rather than saying, oh, it doesn't matter or trying to dismiss it or something. That is certainly what a reasonable author would do. So in general, you should be suspicious of unsourced quotes. Um, I have a lot of experience with this because I run discussion forums, and people will post misquotes on the forums. Frequently, they misquote what I said in the discussion, or what someone else said in the discussion. Like, they're not just misquoting some obscure thing. They will actually misquote the discussion they're currently in, which is all in text, and the text is available on their computer. It's all documented. It's all right there, and they'll still misquote it. And I've tried uh, making rules about it, I've tried warning people, I've tried threatening to ban people if they keep misquoting, and they'll still misquote. 
people seem to be really, really bad at it. And authors are supposed to be better, and on average, I think they are better, but it's still kind of sketchy. So David's policy for the book, in my understanding, was whenever he gives a quote or something that needs a source, he puts the source in line in the text unless it's in the bibliography at the end of BOI. And then if it's in the bibliography, he doesn't have to give a source. He can just mention it, and the bibliography is the source. I do not love that policy. I think it gives people a wrong impression because people don't know that that's the policy. They just see a quote with no source, and they think quoting things with no source is okay. So I think he should have used endnotes, where every book in the bibliography has a number, and then when he wants to refer to something in the bibliography, and he doesn't want to write out what it's from, he can just use the number. And so that would be pretty compact and reasonable while giving specific sources for things. And so anyways, but so there's two Feynman books in the bibliography, and the quote is not in either one of them. So even if Feynman said the quote somewhere, Dee Dee screwed up because he didn't give a source, except for the Feynman books in the bibliography, and it's not in those books. So even if there was somewhere else that he said it, Dee Dee still did it wrong. But I don't think there is somewhere else he said it. I'm very doubtful of that at this point. So what kind of writing process leads to this kind of misquote? Like, how do you postmortem this kind of thing? What actually happens? Um, some people just think, oh, he made a mistake and try to move on. But it's important to come up with explanations. That's one of the things BOI talks about is explaining what's going on instead of being dismissive and not doing enough analysis. We need to actually understand things and try to understand concepts and causality and stuff. So this is a scenario where you can do that. You can think about what might have happened. So one thing that could have theoretically happened is Dee wanted a Feynman quote, and he did a web search, and he found one on some random web, say, random web page with no source, and then he put it in the book, and he thought that was perfectly fine, and maybe that's just how he does quotes. You know, hopefully that's not it. But that is one causal explanation. And then you can think, okay, well, what else might have happened? Are there any that are more favorable to him? What else can you brainstorm that would actually make sense? And it's fairly hard to think of things that make sense. Like, there aren't a lot of easy-to-think-of possibilities that explain how this happened. How do you put a quote in your book with no source and somehow think that you had a source or that it was okay or something? So one of the things that might potentially have happened is that he was writing and he was in like a flow state. He's like into what he's writing and he wants to keep going and he's like progressing rapidly. And then he needs a Feynman quote. So he searches really quickly and he grabs one and he throws it in the book and then he keeps writing. So he knows he doesn't have a source. He knows it needs more attention, but he didn't want to disrupt his writing flow. So he kept going. And so in that case, he would have planned to search for it later, but he forgot. That's a more favorable explanation that makes some sense, but it's still pretty bad. Because if you're going to do that, you need to write down a note. And if you're writing a book over multiple years, you need an effective way to take notes that you actually get to later. So he should have a system in place for taking notes and keeping track of things while he's writing the book. I'm sure he did have some sort of system. So if he just quickly grabbed the quote and threw it in, why did not nothing get entered into a system so that he would revisit it later and look into it? I don't know. It could be that he's seen a similar Feynman quote before, like he remembered it. He's like, I remember Feynman saying something like that. So then he searched and he found a quote and it seems similar to what he remembered. So he trusted it, even though there was no source. I've learned over the years to be more and more suspicious of quotes as I found a lot of errors. And that's part of why I searched for this one a couple days ago. And at first I expected to find a source. Like when you check up on things, often, they're fine. They're legitimate. There's nothing wrong. You know, so I wasn't like actually expecting it to be wrong when I first searched for it. But I'm like, oh, I want to read this in context and I don't see a source right here and I'll search for it. And, you know, and then I try and then I don't find it right away and then I get more suspicious. So it's important to cultivate a skeptical attitude. And I'm going to talk about another story that gives some background context on David's attitude to quotes because there's a problem there. And there's now a pattern because we have two things. And these are not actually the only two, but... So in 2011, 
I questioned David's quote of William Godwin. It was in a private email. And he got really upset about that. He wasn't like, oh, good, you should be questioning quotes. Um, it was upsetting to him. So there's something wrong there. There's something wrong with his attitude. And the story is actually kind of bizarre. Because what, so he sent me some claims about Godwin. Uh, I don't think he used quotes or not the relevant quote, at least initially. But anyway, so I asked him for a source. Um, it was part of an ongoing debate. And he was like claiming Godwin said this stuff that uh, contradicts my position. And so, of course, I'm going to want a source. I'm not just going to believe him. I've read more Godwin than him. I was researching this stuff in detail, and he's telling me I'm misunderstanding Godwin. So, of course, I want a source. And he writes back and he quotes some Marxist secondary source. So it's like a, a Marxist author summarizing his opinions about Godwin, which from both of our perspectives are biased because we don't agree with Marxists. And anyways, it's not a primary source. It's not Godwin actually saying it. It's just some guy. And um, we we both are well aware that a lot of the secondary literature about Godwin is really bad, just like it is with Popper. So I don't know why that would be the first thing you do is send me this secondary source when I asked for an actual source. So I had to clarify that I wanted a primary source. And then he said Godwin Passim. And Passim means to be found at various places throughout the text. So that is not a source. That was also a weird response. Um, it seemed like careless and unreasonable. And that was, you know, first he said it without a source, then he gave me a bad source, and then he said Godwin plus him. So that's his third error in a row where I'm trying to get an actual source for him and I'm not getting it. And I actually wrote back to him that it was not Pessim because the thing he was claiming about Godwin is not throughout Godwin in general. Um, it's maybe in a couple really specific places and that's it. And in general, you can actually find Godwin saying the opposite over and over again, as I had already sent David quotes of. So if David is claiming, okay, yeah, he got it right in a lot of places, but then in a couple places he screwed up, you can't say, well, it's Pessim that he screwed up. It's not found in general. It's maybe this like special exception where Godwin screwed up. So anyways, no source, still no source. And then the next thing I have, David typed in quotes from a first edition instead of using copy-paste. And this is a an unusual thing to do. Why not copy-paste? There's, it's not hard to find the book online. I don't know why he would use this paper book and, and type it in. When you type things in, you can make typos, so that's a problem that you have to be really careful with. Um, and he still didn't give a specific source. He was like, it's in Political Justice in uh, Volume 8. So he's like narrowing it down to an eighth of a book. And it's a long book. And anyway, so he was typing it in from a first edition, but he didn't tell me that. And the third edition is the normal one. It's the most recent one. So I search the book and I don't find the thing David said. And I'm like, and I tell him, I'm like, there's a problem. I like, I'm not finding this quote. It doesn't seem to be in the book. So I just said it like matter of factly, like straightforward, just stating the issue that I couldn't find the quote in the book. And David got really defensive and upset. He felt like I had accused him of fabricating quotes and making things up when I just stated that the problem that I wasn't finding the book when I searched. One of the things that happened, by the way, that was interesting um, that I discovered is there's a first edition online. Well, it said it was a first edition, but it was mislabeled. It was a later edition, second or third. I didn't check which one, but anyways. So I tried to search the first edition when David said that he had used the first edition, and then the, the online first edition still didn't have the quote. And I'm like, huh. But fortunately, I checked another edition and like compared them and realized that that whole book online that someone had put online and said, here's the first edition, here's the whole book, was mislabeled and wasn't a first edition. So it was weird. You, you can't trust people. So anyways, the, uh, the exact quote David had turned out to be correct, like he would typed it in from the first edition, but his behavior uh, was really bad. You know, he should be praising me for persisting with questions until I find a correct original source. That's the right thing to do. But that was not his attitude. He got defensive. He felt attacked. He didn't like having his quote questioned. And so attitudes like that lead to more misquotes. They make it harder for errors to get corrected. It was unfortunate because, as he says in BOI, um, basically the, the one immoral and irrational thing to do is screw up the means of correcting errors. That's a paraphrase, not a quote. So to recap, um, most authors cannot be trusted with quotes. You see them give a quote, and you should be a little bit skeptical. There's a good chance that it's a correct quote, like maybe 80 or 90 percent. But, you know, there's a significant error rate when people present quotes. And 
I thought Dee Dee was a better quoter who was set apart from a typical author, and I was wrong. So I wanted to share that you need to be skeptical of the text you're reading. If you're trying to learn from this book, you need to keep in mind that every quote in it might be incorrect. If the quote is important to you, if it means something significant to you, then you should check the original source and make sure it is a real quote. Because David's writing process allows fake quotes to get into his book. So he did not do adequate checking for you. You have to check things yourself. Um, you should not spread a quote or talk about one without checking it yourself. And you should not talk about a quoted thinker like, say, oh, I learned about how Feynman said blah, blah, blah. Like, you shouldn't be paraphrasing Feynman or saying it's a position Feynman held or anything using any information that you learned from a quote that you haven't checked. So do not just have faith. Do not have blind trust. And it's, it's not just quotes. You should be skeptical about facts. If it makes a factual claim and something important depends on that factual claim, you should look it up instead of just believing it because David said so. So it's unfortunate, but there it is. That's how you have to deal with these kind of things in order to protect your own learning from having other people's errors put into your head. So if you like this, if you're interested in my ideas, you can learn more at my website, criticalfallibilism.com. And if you go there, you can click at the top right or the top or the bottom right uh, to subscribe to emails and receive emails from me.